and I will go ahead and start the recording now. Uh, our agenda for tonight will be, um, we'll review the agenda and then we'll go ahead and start go through roll call of all the members. Uh, I don't think we have any updates for tonight since this is the first meeting. And then we'll go ahead and move into discussing the community boundaries, air quality 101, the steering committee charter, public comment, and then uh, we'll go into closing remarks and adjourn. And we do try to run a tight ship. So we are planning on ending at exactly 7 p.m. Uh, if anything happens and we end earlier, then great, but we do intend to end by 7 p.m. Next slide, please. And now I'll go ahead. Um, uh, I'll actually, before we go into this presentation for community boundaries, I'm actually going to call roll call for uh, the committee members and to see who is here tonight. I'll go ahead and start with uh, Manuela Castañeda. If you are here, if you could please let me know. Um, if you are in the Spanish channel, if you could go ahead and add that in the comments uh, that you are here. Okay, great. Next person is Olga Espinosa. Olga, if you are here, if you could go ahead and let us know. I'm here. Perfect, thank you. Uh -huh. Wendy Barrientos. Are you present? Here. Great. Rudy Lopez. Here. Thank you. I'm here. Juan Manuel, Manuel Orneado. Hi, it's Juan Miguel. I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> Jason Wells. Uh, here, good evening. Margarita Gonzalez. I'm here. Great. Mariano Muñoz. Here. Alejandro Amador. Here. Stanford Morrison. Okay, Stan Morrison, thank you. Uh, Leslie Gallegos. I'm here. Perfect. Jenny Quintanilla. Quintana, I'm sorry. I'm here. Diane Vermeulen. I'm here. Irma Cepeda. Irma Cepeda. Are you here? Okay. Um, Irma is not here today. Uh, Phil Trom. I'm here. Great, perfect, thank you. All right, looks like we have uh, everyone here today. If I'll go ahead and pass it on to Domingo, which will start with our first presentation, which will discuss the community boundaries uh, for this committee. Domingo, thank you. take it away. Thank you, Melina. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, for those of you who uh, may not know me, my name is Domingo Vigil. I'm a deputy director here at the San Diego County Air Pollution Control District. Uh, at our previous meeting, we had discussed just very briefly um, the overall scope of the community air protection program and um, our, our plan in general to uh, work with the San Isidro and Otay Mesa East uh, communities to develop uh, strategies to improve air pollution uh, in this uh, international community. So right now I'll, I will do a quick recap of just the boundaries for the community. What are some of the, uh, what are the census tracts that are included in those boundaries and why it is that we selected those, um, those boundaries for the community. So um, just a, as, a, uh, as a background, uh, as background information, uh, we have been uh, gathering information on uh, the border community. APCD has conducted preliminary air quality monitoring uh, at the San Isidro Fire Station. We have a site there. We also have another site at the Donovan State Prison, and we are working to have a third site, a third monitoring site at the uh, CHP facility in Otay Mesa. Uh, we uh, are partnering with the California Air Resources Board to get additional information uh, on air quality uh, with community organizations such as Casa Familiar, who has advocated for improved air quality in the community for many years. 
and with San Diego State University School of Public Health, who has been involved in conducting health and air quality research in the international border community for many years. Um, in addition, APCD has looked at the community demographics and pollution burden um, for the community based on Cal Virus Screen. And we'll uh, learn a little bit more today about uh, partnering with the SANDAG as well. So going back to um, the data that we've looked at uh, from Kellen Virus Screen. So just briefly, Kellen Virus Screen is a, a, a science-based uh, mapping tool developed by, uh, by the state of California, by OEHA and Cal EPA that ranks every census tract in the state based on pollution burden and demographic characteristics uh, for those to identify those uh, communities who are most impacted by uh, air pollution and, and who suffer a disproportionate burden of air pollution. So in the two overall categories, if we look at pollution burden on the map at the top, you'll see the darkest, uh, the darkest shades uh, there indicate that those communities are or those census tracts are the ones with the highest uh, pollution in that area. So we have all of the um, Otay Mesa East and also uh, on the western uh, side of, of San Isidro as, as, a high, as a darker colors. And then when we contrast that with population characteristics, for population characteristics, um, this tool basically looks at things like asthma, cardio cardiovascular disease, low birth weight, education, housing burden, linguistic isolation, poverty, unemployment, so everything that would make a community more vulnerable to the effects of air pollution. And we can clearly see um, you know, the community of San Isidro highlighted in the darkest colors, which means uh, there's a lot of vulnerability in that community to air pollution. So when we combine those two, uh, those two maps, that basically gives us the selection that you see um, on that red polygon. And it's seven census tracts that are um, uh, that this community comprises, and it's it's basically uh, San Isidro and East Otay Mesa, and then uh, all the area there by the uh, Tijuana River Valley. So this is our area of study, and th this will be our our focus area for this community. So when we're talking about uh, pollution so sources, when we're talking about effects of pollution in the in the community, and when we um, explore different strategies to reduce air pollution. These are the boundaries of, the, of our area. These are the boundaries of the community that we will be uh, working on. Um, this has been selected by the California Air Resources Board as part of this uh, statewide program. So CARB um, select, uh, so selects communities across the state um, based on, uh, you know, based on calendar virus screen scores and also information that might be provided by the different air districts in the state. And um, just last February, this uh, international border community was selected by CAR for this program. Um, I'm, I'm just going to pause uh, and uh, see if there's if there are any questions uh, from anybody or any comments on this. If, if folks want to raise their hands, uh, and I see Jason has uh, his hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just, when you mentioned the monitoring stations, mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned the, um, the fire station. I thought we had a lot more of that. And if we don't, then that may be the only reason that we're not as dark as we, as, as we should be in that first map, the contamination. There, there are other uh, monitoring efforts. Um, actually, Casa Familiar and, and uh, Jenny, as you, as you um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you are also collecting data. And when we are, when we look at developing a broader um, uh, monitoring plan, we'll we'll take all that data into consideration and we're looking, we're hoping to expand our, our presence in terms of air quality monitoring. That's part of the main tasks uh, for this steering committee is to help us inform uh, an air quality monitoring plan for this community. So the sites that I just mentioned um, serve us as just collecting preliminary data, but our hope is to expand that network uh, in the community. So thanks for bringing that up, Jason. We will definitely um, uh, gather more input from from this group 
as we develop the plan. Any, any other questions or comments from anybody? And I also just wanted to mention before uh, we move to uh, our next item on the agenda, you will continue to receive um, information on this. We'll, we'll probably um, reiterate some of this information uh, at our next few meetings as we continue to expand um, you know, the membership of, of this steering committee. Hopefully we will have more community members and more organizations join us in future meetings. So we'll, we'll try to bring everybody up to speed. And um, if at any point anybody has any questions uh, or needs uh, any information, please feel free to uh, touch base with me or with Melina and we'd be happy to provide any information that, um, that you may need. I think I saw another hand up and it just went down. So I'm not sure if, if, that, if that was a comment or a question from anybody. I think they just went, I think they went down. So I think we can okay. um, move forward. Um, and I All just right. want to add also, if anyone has any questions uh, throughout any of these presentations, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, we will go ahead and answer your questions as we move along through the presentations. Um, I think we can go ahead and resume, Domingo. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing uh, this presentation, then we'll go um, to our next presentation. If you can just give me one second, please. All right. Trying to put the presentation back up. And Melina, please let me know if you can see the presentation. The presentation is up. All right. You're good to go. All right, thank you. Just trying to find my, I have several windows open. I apologize. I'm trying to find my um, presenter notes. All right, so for our next item on the agenda uh, is an Air Quality 101 presentation. Um, the, the main purpose for this presentation, uh, and I'll go over, over our objectives in our next slide, but it's really to provide a, a foundation, um, a, a foundational understanding of air pollution um, for this committee. As we move forward with our, with our project, um, uh, it's important for everyone to have uh, an understanding of what, what it is that we're trying to improve in the community. What is air pollution? What does it look like? What are some of the main uh, pollutants? Um, and again, if at any point during our, our time together, um, there are any questions or we need to revisit this topic or bring back the presentation or any additional information, we'd be happy to do that. So for this presentation, we're partnering with the California Air Resources Board, as well as SANDAG, uh, just uh, to give everybody a little bit more context for, for the three agencies that are presenting to you today. Um, APCD uh, is a local um, uh, air quality uh, management agency. And we what we do is we oversee, uh, we regulate um, sources of pollution that are not mobile. So anything that's, uh, that's uh, basically a, a brick and mortar type of operation that produces pollution, that's what we regulate. And then the California Air Resources Board regulates all the sources of pollution that move, right? So like your, your cars, your trucks, um, et cetera. And then SANDAG uh, also uh, is, a, is a metropolitan planning agency. So they they partner with the different jurisdictions uh, on planning for transportation uh, region wide. So um, together we'll, we'll conduct this presentation and, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. So what's the, again, going back to the main objective of, of today's presentation for our Air Quality 101 is to provide that basic understanding of pollution. What are the effects of air pollution? What are the types of pollutants uh, that, we'll be, um, that we'll be studying? And then what are the sources of those pollutions? What's producing all that air pollution? We'll do a very brief introduction to emission inventories. 
Um, and uh, and we'll, we'll come back at a later meeting uh, with a more detailed information on this, but we want to definitely introduce this terminology and, and what we'll be looking at in the future. And then finally, um, we'll, we'll hear from you, from all of you here about um, what are some of the key corridors and streets that need better estimates for, for activities from, from vehicles so that we can better estimate um, air, air emissions um, from those streets and corridors. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues and CARB to continue the presentation. Hey, th thank you, Domingo, uh, and good evening, CSC. Like, uh, my name is Gokwon Lim. I am uh, with the Office of Community Air Protection, or OCAP, at CARB. I am the technical liaison for this community. Um, so for the next uh, 10 slides or so, I'm going to do my best to prepare, like, uh, give some, like, basic information so you guys can, like, have a better understanding of, like, what my colleague Jenny will be uh, presenting down the road. Uh, down, not down the road, down uh, in this presentation on the preliminary inventory. So first I would like to like briefly go over what the very basic of what exactly is air pollution. So during my part, part of the presentation, feel free to raise your hand, uh, type in the chat, stop me. Uh, like, so I wanna make this as in interactive as I, I possibly can. So like, Think of me as like a, a teacher at your university or something like that. So yeah, like that's since I got the out of the way, I'm just gonna continue. So uh, what is your pollution? Like air pollution is like any substances in the air that can cause harm to human health and also the environment. There are like monitoring data have seen shown that like uh, over 90% of Californians brief unhealthy year, air levels of like one or more types of air pollution during uh, some parts of the uh, year. So uh, prolonged exposure to high levels of air pollution impacts our ability to brief. It can worsen underlying health conditions and cause some serious long-term health impacts or premature deaths. Uh, next slide, please. So, Air pollution, unfortunately, does not affect the population uniformly. Some individuals may be more sensitive to uh, these toxic uh, exposures than the general public. These uh, people who are sensitive include young, younger children, elderly folks, and people with underlying health issues, most notably asthma. Uh, they are among those who have higher risk of developing serious health issues when they are exposed to air pollution. And the re the areas where these occupants uh, uh, like are located at uh, are known as sensitive receptors, and these places include hospitals, clinics, uh, schools, daycare facilities, and nursing homes. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, I know this is a really really wordy slide, so I'm gonna. Uh, try to be as brief as I can. So to protect the population, including those who are most susceptible to air pollution, the US uh, Environmental Protection Agency, US EPA, and CARB like, established health-based ambient air quality standards. So the US EPA has set National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs, for six pollutants. Those are the six pollutants on this list, uh, which are ozone, carbon monoxide, lead, Nitro, uh, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter, both PM10 and PM25. I'll come back to that in a little bit. These six are referred to as criteria pollutants. So why are they called criteria pollutants? This is because they are pollutants with which acceptable levels of exposure. They're considered safe for the public, including those who are most sensitive to the effects of air pollution can be determined. And second, they the and ambient air quality standards have been set. Fun fact, like uh, the California actually has our own um, um, ambient air quality standard called the California Ambient Air Quality Standard, CAAQS. And instead of six, we have like four additional pollutants, which are hydrogen sulfide, sulfates, visible, uh, visibility reducing particles or HACE, and vinyl chloride. 
And the first CAQS actually predates Max by uh, an entire year. Next, please. So while there are six criteria pollutants on the Max and 10 on the CAQS, today I'll only be focusing on the nitrogen oxides and particulate matter, which are pollutants that my colleague Jenny from the Air Quality Planning and Science Division, AQPSD, will cover in her <coughs> excuse me, in her International Border Community Preliminary Emissions Inventory Preview later uh, in later during this orientation. So what are NACs? Uh, what are NOx? Sorry, like a bunch of like, acronyms uh, are like tying up my tongue right now. Uh, nitrogen oxides or NOx are highly reactive and poisonous gases. Like they often appear brownish in color. So in the atmosphere, they react with volatile organic compound, VOC, which is something we will come back to in a little bit, uh, to produce ozone or more commonly known as smog. Like prolonged uh, exposure to uh, prolonged exposure to high levels of NOx causes like uh, can cause intensified allergy responses. So their study have shown that uh, exposure to NOx is associated with higher rates of premature death, decreased lung uh, function in uh, growth in children, respiratory uh, symptoms, and then increased emergency room visit due to asthma. NOx is emitted by automobiles and industry sources when fuel is burned at high temperatures. So the most common sources include trucks, off-road vehicles, power plants, boilers, and turbines. So uh, like you might have noticed, hey, uh, why am I talking about NOx when in the previous page we talk about nitrogen dioxide NO2? So air quality regulators have like selected NO2 as marker for controlling ambient levels of NOx. So NO2 correlates extremely well with other uh, nitrogen oxides. So basically NO and N NO2, NO plus NO2 equals NOx. So basically it's easier to track. Next, please. So we're gonna go into what we call a particulate matter. So particulate matter or PM is not a single pollutant. Uh, but they are a mixture of many chemical species in the form of solids and aerosol. So they vary in size, shapes, and chemical compositions. They may contain inorganic ions, metallic compounds, aluminum carbon, organic compounds, and other compounds from the Earth's crust. So if you look at the picture on the right, uh, that's the comparison of, a, uh, of PM10 and PM25 to a human hair. PM10 are particulate matter that's 10 microns or less in diameter. And PM25 is those who are less than uh, 2.5 microns in diameter. So this means PM25 makes up part of PM10. So finer particulates uh, travel deeper into your lungs and respiratory system. That's why we have a different uh, 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 that's why we treat PM10 and PM25 differently. And studies have shown that short-term exposure, which is up to a 24-hour duration of PM25, is linked to premature mortality, increased hospital admission for heart and lung disease, bronchitis, asthma attacks, respiratory syndrome, and emergency room visits. Long-term exposure, which is months to years, have been linked to premature death, particularly in people with chronic heart or lung diseases, and reduce lung function growth in children. In the next slide, I will go through some of the most common sources of PM10 and PM25. So uh, next, please. So both PM10 and PM25 are commonly emitted from the burning of gasoline, oil, diesel fuel, and wood products. Um, common like PM10 sources would also include dust from landfills, unpaved roads, agriculture practices, wildfires, brush waste burning, and industrial sources. Um, feel free to let me know if I'm going way too fast. Uh, like, uh, you can always stop me. But if I, I'm just going to pause for uh, a little bit to see if there's any questions. If not, I'm going to move to the next slide. 
Does anyone have any questions, any like concerns, anything that any clarification that they need on any of the items? Oh, it looks like we do have a question in the chat. It says, are hydrocarbons included in PM measurements? I would like to say yes, because carbons, but like I would definitely need to defer to someone who under, uh, would probably understand this better than I would. Yeah, uh, Mariana, yeah, hi, this is Chandra Misra with the uh, OCAP at CARB. So yeah, I mean, the hydrocarbons are pretty much counted as like gaseous species. Uh, so like they're not really a part of like a particulate matter, uh, but as uh, Gokwan mentioned, like for PM, it's mostly like uh, elemental carbon, black carbon, organic carbon, like those are the kind of species that are counted towards PM. So, and I think like there's a chat message essentially clarifying that. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shandan. I think, uh, does anyone have any other? Um, okay, great. Welcome, Mariana. I think there's um, a second half of Mariana's question in the chat. Let's see. I assume the weight of the molecule decides how long particulate matter stays in the air before potentially settling. Which particles stay aloft the longest? Unfortunately, I do not have the answer to that off the top of my head. So maybe if one of my yeah. colleagues could answer that, I could defer to them. <laughs> Yeah, I, I could make an attempt. Uh, so, uh, Mariana, essentially, uh, the, the the smallest particles, like ultrafine particles, uh, essentially they are cleared out very quickly, like through processes like diffusion. And on the other side, we have like uh, really coarse particles, like dust and uh, like crustal elements. Uh, they can also settle, you know, just through like gravity. So it's really the uh, the PM two point five fraction, basically from let's say about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 micron from where the cutoff for the ultrafine is to all the way to 2.5 micron, uh, they can stay actually aloft for quite some time. And there have been like a lot of studies uh, in the SoCal area, like, you know, how the, uh, the emissions which occur, for example, in LA area through mobile sources emissions and as they travel, you know, eastwards towards like uh, Claremont and Riverside and all those areas, uh, you know, they undergo transformation. So that's why like they linger for too long because they're, they're just the right size for not to be uh, flushed out by diffusion and they're, you know, or by like, uh, by settling. So hopefully that was a, a decent enough answer. If you have any, you know, uh, further, you know, clarification, let me know. <clears throat> okay. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank you um, so much, Mariano. And uh, all right, like that kind of stunted me, like two questions that I could can I answer at the top of my head, but let let us like push forward. So aside from the criteria pollutants, I also wanna bring up a brief discussion of toxic air contaminants or TAC. Uh, both criteria pollutants and TAC are measured statewide to assess adequacy of programs for cleaning the air. So what are attacks? Attacks are pollutants that may cause serious long-term effects such as cancer, even at low level. Unlike criteria pollutants, tax have no state or national ambient standards, while some tax have threshold level, which concentration lower than is considered safe. Most air toxins have no known safe levels, and the cardboard has not identified a safe threshold level for any tax that causes cancer. Officially, the cardboard has uh, identified about 200 pollu uh, pollutants as tech. Today, we're just going to focus on two groups of them, uh, volatile organic compounds, VOC, which includes species like benzene, formaldehyde, and also diesel particulate matter. Uh, next page, please. Okay. Uh, Volatile organic compounds or VOC are carbon compounds, excluding, here's a list, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, metallic carbides or carbonates, and ammonium carbonates. Not all VOC species are volatile and high reactive, and not all are toxic. 
Exposure to high levels of VOC, however, can cause irritation in your eyes, nose, or throat, headaches and nausea, liver, kidney, or central nervous system damage, and even cancer. So they are uh, emitted from a wide array of everyday products, which would include paints, cleaning supplies, building materials, and furnishing. Outdoor sources of VOC include emissions from chemical plants, oil and gas facilities, cooking, burning of wood, fuel oil, and gasoline. So down the road, you're uh, in this presentation, you also hear uh, the terminology of reactive organic gases, ROG, uh, in addition to the VOC that we just went on to. So simplest way I can explain this is TOG, in, uh, total organic gas, includes all carbon compounds, including VOC, uh, which, uh, and, but excludes the same carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, metallic carbides, and uh, ammonium carbonate. ROG are the reactive gases, and they are instrumental to the formation of ground level ozone, or more commonly known as smog. I'm, uh, apologies to the uh, interpreter. I just got a uh, I just got a message saying that I, I went was going way too fast. Uh, is there a place that I need uh, you want me to start over from, or as, am I good to go from here? I think maybe if you can give like just a really brief overview, um, just a very superficial one, maybe that might help um, just kind of clarify things. Okay, so um, there, so like I kind of went over the what VOCs are and they are carbon compounds, they are volatile. Uh, not all of them are volatile, not all of them are highly reactive and not all of them are toxic, but like exposure to a high level can cause like irritations to your eyes, nose, or throats. It might cause headache and nausea. It might also cause liver, kidney, and central nervous system damages, and they might even cause cancer. So they are emitted from a wide array of everyday products like paints, cleaning supplies, building materials, and furnishing. Common like outdoor sources of VOC are like chemical plants, oil and gas facilities, cooking, burning of wood, fuel oil, and gasoline. So, and um, I also went into like the different terminologies that you might hear, total organic gases, TOG, reactive organic gases, ROG, in addition to VOC. So um, essentially the TOG is all carbon compounds, including VOCs. Um, ROG, is reactive uh, organic gas is basically reactive gases, and they are instrumental to the formation of ground level ozone, which is smog when they react with NOx, which we covered a couple slides ago. Uh, next, please. And this would be my last slide. So uh, I'd like to talk about diesel particulate matter or the DPM, which is the solid material found in diesel exhaust. So 90, more than 90% of DPM is actually smaller than one micron. So they are a subset of PM25. As we have previously described, finer part, uh, particles travel deeper into your lungs and they are known to increase the rates of cardiovascular and respiratory hospitalization and premature death. Uh, studies have also shown that 70% of the total known cancer risk related to air toxins in California is due to DPM. Most common sources of diesel uh, exhaust emissions is from ships, trains, trucks, uh, rail yards, and heavily traveled uh, roadways. And thank you so much for uh, tuning in, participating in this short orientation with me. Um, it, I will now take questions if you have any or attempt to, uh, and if not, I will pass it along to my colleague, Jenny, to give an orientation on preliminary emissions inventory that the AQPSD has developed.
Uh, looks like Mariano um, has a question and he's asking, would the transport of chemicals result in a significant source of VOC dispersal in the environment? Transport of chemicals, you mean like on like um, vehicles or is that, that's, uh, could you clarify, are you referring to like maybe transport on vehicles, like on ships or? He said trucks, yeah. yes. And I want to add, Mariano, you, you, if you wish to unmute yourself, um, feel free to do so. So I know that like, uh, tr um, like pipe, basically transport of like chemicals through pipeline, uh, especially I'm talking specifically oil and gas has uh, been like basically from leakage is a source of VOC significant uh, not sure like how to quantify that and like in terms of significant or not, but uh, yes. Any other questions before we switch to a different speaker? And, and just this is Domingo. Just wanted to comment quick, uh, briefly too that this these presentations um, today will be posted on our website, so they will be available to everybody. Um, uh, to review at a later date as well. Okay, I think uh, I don't see anyone with their hand raised or any other questions. So uh, we can go ahead and move on to um, the next speaker. Thank you, Juan. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Gokuan. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jenny Melgo. And I work at the California Air Resources Board in the Community Emission Inventory Group. You, heard, you just heard from Gokuan what some of the common air pollutants that impact our health. Continuing that discussion, I'm now going to provide a brief introduction to sources of these air pollutants and a preview of the preliminary emission inventory for our community. And we will also continue asking you to share your ideas in the chat box, and you can also feel free to raise your hands as well. So next month, we will also be coming back to review emissions for the community in details, and also share with you an emission inventory tool that we are developing to see emissions on a map and to help us with our ongoing discussions to better understand and finalize the community emissions. Next slide, please. So what is an emission inventory and why do we need it? Simply put, an emission inventory is an accounting of emissions from all sources of, all, of air pollution in the community. And it serves as a fundamental component of any air quality plan. CARB's Community Air Protection Blueprint calls for the use of emission inventories in the community emissions reduction programs. Emission inventories allow us to identify emission sources in the community, establish a baseline of emissions, set emission targets and strategies, and track emission reductions during implementation. Next slide, please. Emission comes from a variety of sources and contribute to both regional air pollution issues like ground level ozone and smog and local near source issues like exposure to air toxics like diesel PM. I'm going to do a quick pause here. And if you can do me a favor, you can type in the chat box or you can feel free to speak up the, the things that you think contribute to air pollution in the community. Uh, Jenny says emissions Hi. from Tijuana. Okay. Does anyone have any any other suggestions? Uh, long wait times at our land ports of entry. Land ports. Yep. Freight trains Freight. in the middle of the night. Sounds good. Those are yeah. Those are the sources that we expected as well. Traffic will die. 
track traffic from Otai, track traffic on 905. Very cool. All right, I'm just gonna continue moving on. An emission inventory estimates the amount of air pollutants discharged into the atmosphere by emission sources in a region and within a certain time period like a calendar year. Emission inventories are developed with the best data available and are updated over time to reflect sound science and robust new data. Emission sources are broadly classified into four major categories, stationary, area-wide, on-road mobile, and off-road mobile sources as shown in the picture on the right. So I'm gonna check if there's some more comments on the chat box. I guess there's none, so I'll move ahead. Next slide, please. Stationary sources are fixed sources of air pollution. Examples are power plants, gas station, manufacturing facility, and auto body shops. These are the sources that the district oversees. Area-wide sources are those sources spread, spread over a wide geographic area. For example, consumer products like household cleaning products and hairsprays. Paint cleanup and thinning solvents or coatings applied to building structures or houses. Fireplaces, farming operations as well. Both the district and CARB work together to calculate emissions for these categories. On-road mobile sources include any motor vehicles like passenger cars, um, truck, buses, and motorcycles. While off-road mobile sources include off-road engines and equipment, farm, construct, uh, farm equipment or um, construction equipment, airplanes and trains. CARB works on the inventories for both on-road and mobile and off-road mobile sources as well. Next slide, please. As a summary, we are presenting the, the preliminary total emissions for a few air pollutants or a few criteria air pollutants, precursors like reactive organic gases or ROG that cause ground level, uh, ground level ozone, um, ozone formation and air toxics in the international border community for the year 2020. As you can see, for the IBC community, mobile sources, especially off-road, are estimated to be a primary contributor to NOx and diesel PM emissions, while stationary area-wide sources contribute to ROG and PM 2.5 emissions. Note that these are still preliminary results and will continue work with all, with all of you and the district to refine the, and finalize the mission inventory in the next three to four months. So are there any questions or no? Okay, all right, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, please. So to get us, oh, I, I see a hand, hand, hand raise hand. I assure you. Um, um, I think it says Usuario de Zoom. If you could please unmute yourself and ask the question. Sí, muy buenas tardes. Soy Manuela Castañeda. Buenas tardes, Manuela. Ah, uh, estoy de la organización de pertenezco. Soy promotora de casa familiar. Uh, bienvenida. En el 2017, 2018 y 2019, uh, hubo muy fuertes olores que marcaron esta área de aquí de San Isidro. Esto mm. viene siendo a consecuencia del río Tijuana. Uh, que corre a todo lo largo y nos afecta a, a, a los santuarios que tenemos uh, desde la Daily Mart hasta lo que viene siendo Imperial Beach, uh, aquel, aquel, aquel lado de la parte del bordo. Ok. Este, uh, más que nada, esto fue muy notorio en tiempo de verano. 
los olores, como que el olor se dejaba más, más este, resaltaba más en, en ese tiempo de verano. Les digo porque yo soy asmática y yo cuando veníamos a las alturas, entrando, viniendo hacia el sur, llegando del freeway y subiendo por el 905, el puente, yo notaba los olores que se venían de, de lo que venía siendo de, de los como drenajes, a drenaje. Eh, era un olor muy fétido y, y como yo padezco de asma, lo luego empezaba a, a sentir este, muchos estornudos, dolor de cabeza, mareos y más que nada este, muchas ganas de vomitar porque el olor era demasiado fuerte. Al visitar también a mis padres, eh, que ellos vivían hacia el lado de las Américas, a ellos les afectó por años este olor ahí que ellos vivían en este lado. Entonces, esa es una de las partes también que es muy importante recalcar que eso, ese problema, uh, creo que había un estudio, no sé qué pasaría con el estudio que se estaba realizando, pero este, es muy importante también recalcar esto del río Tijuana. Gracias. Gracias por sus comentarios. Um, eh, sorry, Domingo. Melina, yeah, if I may make a, a quick comment. Um, thank you for, for sharing that information and for sharing your comments. This, all of this input will become very important too as we develop our community monitoring plan for, for the international border community. But I can tell you preliminarily that we are looking um, at uh, also including some monitoring for, um, for, some of, so for some of these this component that you're mentioning about smells um, coming from the Tijuana River Valley. So um, just wanted to put that out there that we're working um, in APCD to, uh, to procure additional equipment, monitoring equipment to be able to monitor for that as well. So we should, have, we should be able to have more information on that um, in the future and to also integrate it as part of this, uh, of this effort with the community. So thank you for your comments. No, gracias a ustedes. And I believe we had a comment in the chat from uh, Jenny. She asked, was the CBP airstrip near the Tijuana Estuary, Tijuana Estuary Nature Center included in the inventory? And I think you, did you already address that, Domingo? And it says- um, uh, No, but uh, uh, Sharania Char from CARB uh, already answered already that. Already addressed it. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Okay, Sharania. Okay. Oh, I just want to clarify is what is the what the CBP stands for? Is this the Brown, municipal Brownfield Airport? That's Customs and Border Protection. I'll go somewhere. Okay, sounds good. Okay. okay, moving on. To get us started on refining and improving our draft emission inventory, district and card staff have started collaborating with the San Diego Association of Governments or SANDAG, our regional local partner for transportation planning. With a port of entry and cross-border vehicle activity in the IBC community, we are committed to work together with you to better understand community concerns related to vehicle emissions. This will help us improve, uh, develop and improve existing data and methods to estimate emissions from on-road mobile sources and will also support strategy development for community emission reduction plan and track progress for, during implementation. With that, I will now hand it off to our SANDAG team for their presentation, but I'm also happy to answer some questions if you have it right now, or otherwise I can answer that after the SANDAG presentation. Thank you everyone for listening and please free to connect with us and you can always put, you know, put your comments and questions on the chat and then we can try or we'll try to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny, and, and thanks, Domingo, for having this item on the agenda today. Um, my name is Phil Trom. I am the 
manager of intergovernmental coordination at Sandag. So I oversee the long range transportation planning efforts, air quality uh, conformity efforts, which is germane to this uh, conversation today, borders and binational planning, goods movement planning, and then serve um, as a Sandag connection for the AB 617 groups, including this newly formed one, which we're very, very excited about. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about what we do in terms of our role um, with regard to uh, transportation and planning in the region, um, in addition to our role with uh, AB 617 and resources to APCD and CARB. Um, so uh, as was mentioned at the top, Sandag is the regional uh, a planning agency for San Diego County. We're a one county planning agency. So we plan, build, fund, uh, and, and fund um, uh, regional transportation uh, projects, among many other things. Um, so uh, one of our, our core component, our core responsibilities is, is the development of our, our 30 year uh, a blueprint for regional growth and, and planning of transportation projects. Um, and, and along with that is the air quality analysis. And so I know it previously was discussed all the different elements of air quality conformity with the particulate matter and, and ROG and NOx and, and carbon monoxide and that sort of thing. So we, we look after that um, uh, in our planning. Um, and so uh, actually on, on the call today is Sam Sanford who manages all those air quality conformity efforts uh, for Sandag, if there are any specific questions to the regional approach. Uh, he's kind of our air quality 101 expert at Sandag, so glad he's able to join today. Um, also, so, you know, not only do we plan for those projects and look out and look after air quality um, conformity uh, per the federal regulations, we also implement projects and programs that are included in our plan. So we have significant authority to do that. Uh, we also support um, a strategic development of, of, of peer uh, agency programs, uh, such as AB 617 and the community emissions reduction plans that, that go along with that and are excited to, to see the development of that through the, the borders community effort um, through AB 617. Um, and as was shown in the, in the previous slides, transportation is just one component of emissions, but it's a big one. And so we have uh, sophisticated regional transportation modeling tools to help us better understand how the future transportation um, network performs and its various impacts, so benefits and impacts. Um, but we don't have models specifically for sub-regional areas. So just wanna provide a little caveat there in terms of uh, how we uh, evaluate things typically is, is more at the regional scale. Um, but to help support the AB 617 border communities work, Sandeg um, uh, worked with APCD and, and CARB to prepare uh, base maps to help showcase uh, how the border communities contribute to overall regional transportation planning. And so uh, my colleague, Zach Hernandez, who um, uh, shepherds a lot of our border uh, work um, and, and projects uh, along the border, um, he'll show, showcase uh, those slides, uh, the, the base maps, uh, in for the border community area. So this does match uh, the, the maps that Domingo shared at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and he'll kind of interweave within that both state efforts and then also how our regional travel demand modeling tools um, are put to use uh, at, uh, in terms of um, uh, looking at different multimodal transportation networks. And then you know, later on how that sort of rolls up as regional analysis and what SANDAC does. So that will help uh, sort of emphasize or sort of realign with uh, with that geographic lens that Domingo started with today. So I'll hand it over to Zach uh, and if we could uh, switch to slide 19. Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, so I think Domingo covered the study area boundary uh, in previous agenda item, but just to set a little bit of context for the slides to follow after this one. Um, obviously, our, our boundaries are kind of conformed for the international border communities to Several census tracts, like Domingo explained, encompass the San Ysidro and Otay Mesa communities and the to total coverage on the western extent of the boundary. You can see on the slide as the, the non-shaded slide or non-shaded area. Uh, and because our, our designation uh, area is kind of wide, all of these following slides are broken out from, from an eastern extent and a western, or western extent and an eastern uh, extent, just, to, just for kind of simplicity. Um, and just as a little bit more disclaimer, and before we show you a bunch of mapping components, I just want to also reiterate um, some of what Phil said. And uh, the Sandag resources are kind of just here in the presentation slides today, just as a reference to get kind of a flavor of the types of things that 
go into various SANDAG transportation analysis and modeling. Um, and we, you know, develop and maintain these modeling tools that are really best suited for capturing travel at a, at a regional level and within the specific goals of the AB617 program and the community level information that we're hoping to assess and develop some more. Um, some of the SANDAG tools may not be perfectly suited, uh, but they're kind of a starting point. So just keep that in mind and don't feel like you need to take notes on every single one of these data layers that we're going to show. Uh, but uh, APCD and CARB team and SANDAG will, will all kind of work together and continue to facilitate some of the dialogue and discussion to make sure the input from the community is, is fed into these, these processes and we can help uh, refine the tools as we go. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so for the first uh, kind of data layer slide, the Calm Virus Screen um, version 4.0 score, this is also something that Domingo covered in, in his uh, portion earlier on. Um, but this is broken out by the census tracts that are within our designation. Um, and hopefully uh, those here today know a little bit about the tool, uh, how it works to quantify the level of impact faced by communities throughout the state um, as that relates to public health, pollution, socioeconomic indicators, that, that sort of thing. But what you see on the screen is kind of the aggregated um, Calumbire screen score altogether. Uh, next slide, please. The same thing for the eastern portion of the, the area. Um, and if you're seeing just one community uh, census track here, you're not hallucinating that there really is one giant, giant census track. Um, kind of a tangent topic to discuss, something that I've always been curious about. But uh, yeah, that, that is the case. That is a, a really big census track. But um, next slide, please. So this is the first of a series of slides that show the types of components that go into the SANDAG uh, model, the activity-based model, or ABM as we call it. Um, and like Phil mentioned, it's a regional travel demand model that kind of simulates household activity and travel. Um, and on the screen are what's called transportation or traffic analysis zones. And these are basically the main geographies that we use for automobile analysis in the SANDAG ABM model. And so trips that are done via transit or an active transportation mode are calculated um, at a more detailed geography level. And same thing for the east, as you see on the, on the screen here. These are basically nested within the census tracts, and they're smaller than the census tracts, so they give us a little bit more finite detail. Next slide, please. So this next layer, um, this is the roadway network <clears throat> that comes from the, the SANDAG activity-based model. And it's not a comprehensive or quote unquote all roads network just due to the computation limitations for trying to do something like that. Uh, however, the, this network does include all the major highways, Caltrans facilities and right of way um, and the local roadways classified by the jurisdictions themselves in their general plan circulation elements. Uh, next slide, please. The same thing for the east. Um, again, that's the, the roadway network. Next slide, please. So this next uh, data layer is the transit network. And this is what our ABM model uses to, um, to incorporate all the fixed route transit in the region. Um, and just as a disclaimer, this network doesn't necessarily have the capability to include on-demand services such as paratransit or neighborhood electric shuttles or scooters, that sort of thing. Um, those are kind of handled separately in the model, uh, but this includes all of our fixed route transit, something that is kind of a, a key, a key uh, component of our model. Thanks so, again, the same thing for the, the Eastern side of our community designation. Next slide, please. So um, SANDAG also maintains an all street active transportation network, which is what you're seeing on the screen. This includes the existing and the planned uh, bike projects essentially to support um, basically bike project evaluation and impact analysis for those specific projects. And unlike the roadway or transit networks, uh, the bike and walk trips um, that are outputted from the model aren't necessarily assigned to the network. Um, the trips that you get from our active transportation output um, is in the form of a zone to zone flow. So that's kind of a, a key distinction. Um, next slide, please. Same thing for the, the Eastern portion of our designation. Next slide, please. So this next one is the goods movement uh, network. And this is another critical piece of the puzzle as it relates to uh, mobile source emissions, especially for the, the border community as this group knows. Um, this layer on the screen isn't necessarily a direct component from the activity-based model. 
It's more kind of like an appendage tool that we use to help capture or quantify the trips taken for the purpose of moving purpose of uh, moving goods throughout the region. Um, it's more of like a planning data product. And for many of the planning activities that Sandag um, kind of conducts, uh, it helps us provide some performance metrics on the goods movement network as kind of like a subset of the roadway network that you saw previously. Um, and although the ABM does have a commercial vehicle component, uh, which specifically analyzes heavy duty truck travel, and it can also assign commercial vehicles to the network um, kind of a more, on a more detailed level by vehicle type. Uh, there are some limitations where specialized equipment moves that exist in the Otay Mesa area, uh, especially that may not be reflected in what we can do with this model and the output that we get from this model with the GIS movement layer. Uh, next slide, please. And sorry, Zach, I, this is Domingo. I have a, just a quick question on, oh, sorry. on this. Um, no, no, that's, that's fine. Sorry for the interruption. But while we have the map on the screen, so this uh, goods movement network, all the what we see in yellow here, I see that there's you know this line that extends almost all the way to the ocean. Is that so? That's I'm just trying to understand why that's included in, as part of the goods movement network. So you could consider these lines, these yellow lines, as facilities, basically roadways that can facilitate heavy duty trucks or are designated to facilitate heavy duty trucks. Got it. Um, yeah, so you can think of it that way. Got it. Thank you. Sorry for the, for the interruption. No worries. I think we're almost done with these mapping slides, but yeah, again, same thing here for our eastern portion, and it's kind of a critical critical focus for this kind of subsection of our designation. Um, we could go to the next slide for now. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so that was the, the end of the, the mapping slides. And just to reiterate what was kind of already mentioned, like I said, we develop and maintain these, these tools and they're mainly designed for capturing travel at a regional level. And kind of in that context, there's some limitations to what, what they can do and uh, what the data layers can kind of show us at a more localized level. Um, and obviously with the program, there's a need to identify the more localized sources of emissions and add those to the inventory and make sure the inventory is very robust. Um, so like Domingo's, I'm, I'm sure he's gonna mention it now, but um, there's gonna be some ongoing dialogue that we're hoping to develop with the, the community to make sure that we refine these tools. But with that said, we're Sandag's really looking forward to continuing to support this effort and trying to find more ways to coordinate closer with uh, the agencies as also, also with the community. So um, I'll pass it back to you, Domingo, for, for Q&A. Thank you, Zach. And and just something that I that I wanted to um, just piggybacking on what you just said and trying to remind folks, uh, we would really be interested in uh, any input or feedback as we as we look at these maps. And again, all the maps will be shared with everybody so that you can take a, a closer look at them. Uh, but we just wanted to make sure that we cover those and we walked you through the different maps during today's presentation. But our hope is that we can get uh, comments or input from you as far as any, any streets or corridors that from your perspective are missing that are not highlighted in these maps that, would, that, that can contribute to us as agencies getting better data, better information of the um, emissions that um, vehicle traffic or truck traffic uh, is emitting in these different roadways. Perhaps there's a street that you know of that we didn't capture in the maps that we didn't highlight in the maps or, or a roadway that in your experience, uh, you see a lot of, of traffic that would be very important to include. Um, again, don't feel like you have to tell us everything right now, uh, but just keep it in the back of your mind as you, as you receive these maps. Uh, you know that's something that we're hoping to to get input um, from all of you here and if anybody has any comments right now that they would like to make we're absolutely um open to hearing your your input so we welcome any comments or questions yo tengo un comentario adelante ah uh, mire este aquí en la bayer tienen como dos semanas que están trabajando Y a veces por el por el, el mismo trabajo este están parando mucho el tráfico. Y como por ejemplo, van dos veces que yo trato 
de irme temprano para no agarrar tanto tráfico y a veces me toca que estando parada ahí por el mismo tráfico que hacen los trabajadores, este, me toca que el de la maquinaria pesada cuando están echando como lo negro de, de la carretera, me toca todo el humo a mí y yo voy a tos y tos y tos y tos. No sé si ustedes puedan hacer algo como para que ellos dejen un poquito más de espacio o que muevan un poquito más rápido el tráfico. Bueno, creo, I'm sorry, let me, I'm trying to figure out how to answer the question uh, in which channel. Um, let me perhaps move to the Spanish channel so that I can respond to your question in Spanish. Sí, muchas gracias por su comentario. Eh, en términos de las reparaciones a las, a las calles eh, y del proceso que, que se debe seguir, eso sería algo que podríamos eh, referir a la ciudad ya que son el Departamento de Obras Públicas de la ciudad es quien se encarga de, de realizar este tipo de, de reparaciones. En términos de mover el tráfico más rápido, eh, le puedo decir eh, de manera limitada que hay ciertas reglas que se tienen que seguir en cuanto a la velocidad con la que los conductores pueden manejar a un lado de los trabajadores de obras públicas y esto principalmente con el objetivo de... de pues tener de mayor seguridad para los trabajadores y para los conductores también. Eso es en términos de la velocidad, pero podríamos eh, quizás referir su comentario a la ciudad, al Departamento de Obras Públicas, para que pues, ellos puedan tomarlo en consideración y también si tienen alguna información que nos puedan proporcionar para compartir con usted y con, con el resto del grupo, con gusto lo podemos hacer también. Le agradezco mucho. Uh, does anyone have any other questions before we move on to the next presentation? Okay, uh, Domingo, take it away for the next presentation. All right, and please bear with me as I try to switch presentations on my screen. Just one minute, please. And the next presentation will be to uh, discuss the committee uh, charter, the steering committee charter. All right, let me pull that presentation up. Just one second. I'm sorry, I have multiple screens and multiple windows. No worries. Number two. All right, uh, Melina, can you please confirm if the presentation is on the screen because I can't see it at this point. Yes, it's on the screen. Okay, okay. great. One second. Oh, wait, uh, I have the one that says questions. I, it's the previous presentation, the questions. Oh, it's still the previous? Okay, yeah. let me, sorry, let me go I'm back. Sorry. All right, let me try and get to the next one. Here it is. All right, I think I got it this time. Yes. All right, can you see it on display? Yes. Okay, perfect. Just one second. Oops. All right, so uh, for this last item on, on our agenda for the, as far as presentations, I wanted to touch base uh, with this group on just the, the steering committee charter. Uh, and first of all, I wanted to thank everybody who has signed up and, and submitted their applications to be part of this important steering committee. Um, it's a great opportunity for organizations, for agencies, for residents of the community to provide their input and to really shape how the implementation of this program is going to look like in the in the border community. So it's a it's a it's a great responsibility and it's a, it's, an, it's an important privilege too. So thank you for everybody who has signed up. We are still hoping to get additional members 
um, added to the committee. So we'll continue to accept applications. If you know of anybody who you think would be a good um, addition to the committee, please feel free to reach out to them or reach out to us and we can help um, make that contact uh, with that individual to invite more people to participate. But just to recap um, briefly what the purpose is for this committee, um, you know, the steering committee members will serve as advisors to strategize how to improve our quality and determine what are the needs and priorities of these communities. To serve on the committee, there is no need to be an expert in air quality. Uh, while on the committee, you'll also have the opportunity to learn the process and resources available to improve air quality. So this will be a great way to help affect change in your community and improve the quality uh, of living. So we want to make sure that we have uh, an established process as to how the committee will work. How, how are we going to accept different members? What are the, what's the criteria to be part of the committee? What are some of the rules for you know, how often we're going to be meeting? How are those logistics going to look like? And all of this is really to serve the community and make sure that the community is at the center of the decision-making process for this program. So what you see here on the screen is just a, a very high-level summary of a proposed charter and this, this is based on a charter for a different community, the community of Portside, which is another community that APCD is working with, and that includes National City, Sherman Heights, Logan Heights, uh, and Barrio Logan. We've had a, a, a successful model with that community, so we're hoping to learn from those lessons and bring some of the um, good lessons learned that we've had in that experience and see if that can serve this community as well. So. Again, these are just some highlights from, from that charter and hoping to get additional input. Uh, after today's meeting, we will make sure to share um, a draft charter with all of the steering committee members and, uh, and get any input um, on that. But here are just some of the highlights. So who can be part of the, of the steering committee? The, the steering committee is really open to a residents of the, of the community uh, either people living, working, or people who own a business within the community boundaries that we described earlier. Um, also to community-based organizations, to public health organizations, schools, academic researchers, labor unions, planning agencies, uh, government officials, transportation agencies. So we want to make sure that we have a comprehensive um, and cross-sector um, uh, membership in the steering committee because the the more uh, diverse of a committee we have the better uh, equipped we will be to provide uh, different ideas and different solutions to to the air quality challenges of the community um, we want to make sure however that the majority of the committee is comprised from uh, by residents so we want to have an odd number of members so that you know more than 50 percent can, uh, can be um, uh, members of the, of the community, uh, of residents, uh, I mean. Uh, the commitment to participate in the committee is uh, one to two years. So after two years, um, you, any members who can wish to continue to serve in the committee can, can extend their commitment for an additional year. Uh, but we also want to welcome additional participants uh, and be able to have more people uh, contribute to the committee. Um, one important thing to highlight is that um, stipends are available for residents, for community, for community members who are residents of the community. Um, we would like to provide um, stipends. So what we're planning right now is uh, $75 per uh, meeting. So part of the requirements um, for that is to obviously um, you know, attend every meeting. That's why also our um, taking attendance of the meetings will be very important for us. Uh, right now, uh, we're still in the process of establishing the steering committee and also a process to, um, to make payments of these stipends to the community members, but we will keep track of the meetings that, we've ha that we have had so far so that we can make that uh, retroactive and make sure that we, that we cover that. 
Uh, and then uh, another area that I wanted to highlight is the logistics, um, right? So uh, agendas for the meetings uh, will be uh, posted uh, on our website 72 hours in advance to make sure that everybody knows uh, what's going to be covered. And also as we get a, a larger group of members, we'll, we will run the agendas, the draft agendas, we'll share them with the, with the voting members of the steering committee beforehand, just to see if there's anything else that anybody would like to add to the agenda. And then we will post the final agenda on our website. Uh, for now, we are hoping to have uh, most of our meetings be virtual as we've received a lot of feedback uh, in different communities that this is a, an easier way from, for community members to join uh, the meetings uh, after work or from their homes. Uh, also, as we're hoping to get additional participation from uh, our colleagues on the Mexican side of the border, uh, even if not as official committee members, just as participants or, and collaborators, uh, having virtual meetings will also facilitate that process. Uh, but we, we would also um, uh, plan in-person meetings whenever necessary to make sure that we're accommodating to the needs of the community and the needs of, of this process. Again, the requirement is uh, we're proposing to have monthly meetings. Right now, uh, our calendar is to meet uh, every third, Melina, please correct me if I'm wrong, every third Wednesday of yes. the month. Third uh, Wednesday. <laughs> third Wednesday of the month from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, and as we continue to get additional um, steering committee members, we, we can revisit this to see if there's uh, any adjustments that need to be made to this calendar. Uh, also, uh, we are going to share some uh, rules for participating in the meetings to make sure that everybody feels uh, that this is a, a, a welcoming and safe space to provide uh, input, to provide feedback, that we are sharing our ideas and our comments uh, respectfully and in a way that we also allow space for others to participate. Um, uh, there will be in the in the future different items that will be brought up to a vote uh, to the committee as a way to um, make decisions for the community uh, as part of this process. And every time that we that we need uh, a vote from the committee, we will need to uh, make sure that we have a quorum that the majority of the committee uh, is present. So that, um, so that that decision is, is, is considered by most of the committee members. Uh, and then as, as we move forward into developing plans uh, for monitoring and also for reducing uh, emissions, uh, we will be forming subcommittees to be able to be more agile in developing these plans and have a, a better um, uh, share of the responsibilities with the different committee members and so that we can uh, produce these plans in a timely manner. So I'm going to pause uh, right here and see if there are any questions so far from any of the committee members or any members of the public who are joining us today who would wish to be part of the committee officially. Uh, please uh, feel free to raise your hand uh, or unmute yourself and, and uh, ask your questions or, or share any comments. And I'd also like to add that if anyone in, is in the attendees that would like to speak, just go ahead and raise your hand and I will unmute you. And also you can use the chat. And I think there's a hand from Alejandra. Melina, I don't know if you see Alejandra, uh, if you can unmute her. I, oh, hi, good afternoon, unmuted. everyone. Yeah. I don't know if you there can you hear me, but... We can um, hear you. I, Okay, I just want to say, and I know the the purpose is to have mainly community members from San Isidro, and it's just these hours will be very difficult for anyone in Otay Mesa to participate. So um, I don't know if maybe there could be a subcommittee of Otay Mesa interested parties at a different time uh, to provide maybe feedback or um, because it's certainly a very important talk, topic and I just sort of want to I think the participation from Otay Mesa will lack with this type of schedule. Thank, thank you, Alejandra. We, we will certainly take that into consideration because we, we agree with you. It's very important to have um, the East Otay Mesa community, the, the business community be able to participate. 
Uh, like you mentioned, the, the priority is to really make sure that the community and the residents um, have, um, you know, that ability to participate. So that's why all of the, or at least most that I know of, all of the meetings for this program are at um, after business hours to allow for that participation. Um, you know, a lot of us as agencies also, you know, have, uh, you know, have to attend the meetings after hours. So we're, we're trying to get into the right balance between being open uh, enough to accommodate to a lot of uh, people to attend, but then also making sure that um, our main customers, you know, the, the residents of the communities are able to attend. So we'll continue to explore that option um, and see if there's an opportunity to maybe start the meetings a little bit earlier. So that way it's not um, all of it during business hours, but some of it is, you know, starts a little bit before five and then um, it continues uh, until after five to perhaps uh, it be more inclusive of everybody. But thank you, thank you so much for your comments. And there's, a, there's another hand from Irma Cepeda. Irma, go ahead and unmute yourself. Irma, if you can hear us, um, you can unmute uh, yourself to share your comment or question. I think her screen froze, or at least it froze on my end. Yeah, I think I think it's frozen. Um, Irma, but David, if you can hear us, maybe you can put your question or your comment on the chat, and then we can address it um, through the chat. And uh, sorry, Melina, back to you. You had someone else on the queue. Uh, yeah, David Force. Um, he has a question, um, and I will go ahead and. Um, his oh, question is: yes. uh, And when subcommittees are formed, they can schedule accordingly. Correct, Domingo. That's correct. So when, when we form subcommittees to develop the plans in more detail, um, those subcommittees can decide um, when uh, would be the best time for them to meet. So it doesn't all have to happen uh, during these meetings. Um, and then, sorry, just one more thing, going back to Alejandra, we can also make sure to, um, you know, share agendas, share uh, documents and information uh, with all those uh, members uh, of the East Otay Mesa community who are not able to attend. The meetings are recorded and we're also going to be posting them and making them available uh, to anybody who's not able to attend the meetings. Just uh, uh, something extra that I wanted to mention. Uh, Irma, are you able to unmute yourself now? see that she's no longer frozen. There you go. Ya lo había aprendido. Pero pero este no se fue el audio de ustedes, no escuché nada nada. Yo dije, ¿será el mío? No, dije, el mío no es porque ya no más así. Pero una pregunta Entonces, eh, en la lista que nos mandaron por correo, ahí vienen los horarios y las fechas. Entonces, ¿es probable que la cambien? Esa es mi pregunta. We, we wouldn't be changing the meeting time without the approval of the steering committee. So any, any changes uh, right now, we, you know, we, we had to propose a, a date and a, and a time to start. Um, but when, when we have a, a full steering committee formed, we can have a more formal vote for the day and time and any proposed changes to the date and time of the meetings would have to be approved by vote, uh, by all, all the members of the steering committee. Okay. Muchas gracias. Y otra pregunta tengo, um, una compañera también. Ya, ella hizo la aplicación conmigo también. La hicimos juntas y dice que nunca le mandaron el correo electrónico. O sea que dice que no se pudo meter. Pues le digo que se vuelva otra vez a inscribir. Que vuelva a mandarlo otra vez. If, um, Irma, if she can go ahead and send me a uh, email. 
um, just go ahead and have her send me an email and I'll ensure that uh, her application is received. Just go ahead and have her resend it. Okay. 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 Muchas gracias. Era todo. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, we have um, Christopher Roberts, who also has a question. Christopher, I you go ahead and unmute yourself. No, ju just a comment. Um, so yeah, my name is Chris Roberts. I'm representing uh, TruckNet and Otai. Um, you know, we've been working closely with the uh, APCD in the past to build the first uh, Class Eight natural uh, gas station, and and we're really you know keen and, and working hard on getting some of these uh, Class Eight diesel trucks. Uh, off the road and implementing as many clean energies as we can. Just wanted to, you know, let you know that, you know, I will be present, you know, every third Wednesday for these meetings, uh, regardless of the time. I think I have a, you know, strong understanding of what the environmental challenges are in the area and be able to contribute quite a bit. We appreciate it, Christopher. And then um, if you want to be an official member of the committee, if you don't mind, please sending me uh, your application. Um, and I'm happy to, if you send me an email, I'll go ahead and add my email on the chat shortly. But if you send me an email, I'll, I'm more than happy to send you uh, the application. Sounds good, will do. Great. Uh, do we have any other questions? All right, so just gonna, um finish my uh, presentation here by sharing uh, how to apply to be a member of the steering committee. Um, you can do so by visiting our website at sdapcd.org slash community. Um, you um, would have to fill out a, just a very short application uh, with uh, your information and send it to APCD outreach at sdapcd.org. So uh, Melina can also help us by putting that um, email address on the chat where you can send in, in your application or your interest to be part of the, uh, an official member of the steering committee. Um, before before um, we were hoping to get our, our initial membership going um, by the end of March so that we could have a more um, formalized committee by this meeting. But right now I can share that we still have um, uh, spots open. We're hoping to have a 29 member uh, committee and there's, um, there's plenty of opportunity to receive additional um, applications. So please make sure to submit those as soon as possible and also to refer us to um, any other organizations or residents or community members who you think um, could be a good uh, addition to, to this committee. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Melina. Thank you, Domingo. Okay, we will be moving on to uh, the next item on our agenda, which is public comments. Uh, does anyone have any public comments? Please note that the public comment period is three minutes. Um, if anyone has any public comments that they'd like to add, please uh, raise your hand now. or put it in the chat. Uh, Liliana, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liliana Nunez. I work in the Office of Community Air Protection with uh, Guo Kwan and, um, and, and Jenny and Shandon and Sharanya. So we're all here. Um, let's see, so I just have a quick announcement um, to share with you all. CARB will be having an update um, to their board, to our board, on May 19th to give, um, uh, oops, sorry, sorry. So there's an update um, to the board on the AB 617 statewide strategy. Um, so a little bit of background, um, there are 17 communities now in the program and you all know that as a fairly new community. Um, and in the last few years through our collective work with these 17 communities, um, We've had a lot of lessons learned and it's been time to update the statewide strategy, um, which is our um, community air protection blueprint with, um, that is our guidance for the overall program. And we're also required to update it every five years uh, according to statute. So 
we actually have a very engaged consultation group of various stakeholders statewide and Dr. Jenny Quintana has served on what as one of those very engaged members since uh, 2018. And we also had uh, David Flores um, uh, be part of the uh, membership for a while um, before moving on to um, uh, our board members, um, a supervisor of Vargas's um, office. So anywho, a subset of the consultation group members developed what's known as the People's Blueprint, and it really represents um, their views and ideas on how um, CARB can improve the program, um, especially um, with a, a lens um, towards uh, making the program more equitable for everyone. Um, and then, so in the last few meetings of the consultation group, we've dedicated um, uh, to discussing the people's blueprint so that the entire consultation group um, can can have these discussions about the, the people's blueprint, right? Um, and these discussions will really inform significantly how we um, develop our program blueprint um, update. Um, and so this brings me back to our cardboard meeting on the 19th. Um, we've posted the people's blueprint requesting public comments on it. And the comments we hear there on the People's Blueprint and other ideas on how to improve our program are all part of our public engagement um, to gather information to update our program guidelines. Um, so with that, I'll um, drop a link in the chat um, for more information if you all are interested in joining us and getting some information on our updates. Thanks. Thank you, Liliana. Um, I do see a comment in the chat uh, about changing the date of the meetings. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I'm thinking that that would happen once we have um, the committee fully formed. Would that be correct, Domingo? Correct. We, 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 since we have to accommodate to, you know, the majority of the committee, we'll have to take it to, you know, to a vote. We have to develop some options. Uh, as uh, you know, different times that would work uh, for all all the you know potential times for the participants, and then bring it to a vote. But um, we we can do that when we have a little bit more um, formalized uh, committee. But certainly something that we can explore. Thank you, Domingo. Uh, do we have any other public comments? Anything else that anyone else would like to add? Um, Alejandro, go ahead and please unmute yourself. Hey everybody, Alejandro Amador. Um, I'm here today as a resident, but I also work at Casa Familiar. Most of you know me already. Um, and I wanted to, to invite um, the residents. Uh, I think I'm gonna start trying to have um, some kind of debrief um, after the meetings, not, not the day of, but probably around like a week after to make sure that everyone feels comfortable moving forward. Um, and everybody feels comfortable participating in this in this public meetings as well. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll try to organize that so so everybody can can feel like they come to a space where where they know what's going on and feel comfortable enough to to give their own opinion and, and experiences in the committee. Uh, so I'll try to put those. Um, I'll, I'll try to organize that and I'll put my email on the chat so everybody can reach out to me if, if you're interested in and participating in those um, side meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any other comments? Please go ahead and raise your hand or um, type it in the chat if you have any um, public comments. Okay. Um, Looks like we will be ending a little bit earlier tonight. Uh, so I guess we'll have about 20, 15 minutes left of your evening <laughs> that we're gonna get back. Um, our next meeting will be on May 18th. And like Domingo said, we will be sending out all this information via email. And we will also, also be sending out additional information as well. Uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers that came today and. Uh, gave very valuable information. 
And um, anything else that you'd like to add, Domingo? Uh, nothing from my end, just to thank everybody, um, all of our presenters today as well, all of the organizations who uh, are partnering with us on this important uh, program and all of the residents and everybody who's uh, at the meeting tonight with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Buenas noches a todos. Gracias. Thank you.